We just had Pretty from Skilled Smart in, and and she's an awesome um, example of having an idea and finding a problem and just uh, having a go at it. She's she uh, she had a she had a look at what was the problem with people engaging with their finances and understanding why why people were getting to a whole lot of success in their life, but still not knowing where their super fund was and what their money was doing. And she went out and solved it. So there's a whole lot of interesting discussions that we have around that journey, what she's learnt, how advisors can can actually take um, take some learnings out of it and apply it to how they engage with people. So uh, sit back and enjoy the show. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $10 billion funds under management and one of the fastest growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leading managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Pretty, what's happening? Not much. Mm-hmm. How are you guys? Oh, just good. chilling. Just it's Friday. Chilling. Oh, it is Friday. Wow. It's a good day. Um, we met because uh, you do some pretty cool stuff in the financial education space. And yeah. one thing that I find financial planners don't do amazingly well is public facing education. I think a lot of financial planners get uh, kind of in intimidated or, or mm. scared uh, that they're going to say the wrong thing or put themselves in a difficult situation. Or have the, their compliance team yeah. knock on their door going, <laughs> yeah. what did you say to those kids? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's a real problem, um, which has always kept uh, financial education on uh, sort of on lockdown in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and then you came along. Yeah. And uh, and you were like, yeah, stuff all that stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to go out and teach people. And so, uh, I, like, mad props to you, first oh, of you. all, for, for doing that. And then um, over time, I, I'm not sure if this was quite an angle of yours to begin with, but if I look at your marketing material, uh, it's quite – it's female-focused in a lot of ways. Is that, is, that was that intention? That was never actually deliberate. Yeah, okay. So – it might be coming across. I might just be choosing like yeah, yeah, yeah. Feminine marketing because I'm female. What, I don't what know. is feminine marketing? It's flowers. <laughs> it's a lot of flowers. Oh, that's big. I was bad. gonna say. That I was gonna say bad. pink, but I thought that was a bit. Um, I have strategically stayed away. That's from a bit pink, simplistic. Very deliberately. Um, yeah. So interestingly, I never deliberately intended this to be a female product or yeah. a female yep, oriented yep, yep. business, but I did see that like a good eighty percent of the demand was from women. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have had people, like students, come up to me and say, like, oh, because you're female, I felt more able awesome. to sign up for it. So yeah. it mm-hmm. might be that That's you know, cool. as the face of the business, that has a bit to play with it. But um, it was never intended to be that way. Um, but I think in terms of the marketing angle, I think the effort was not to be feminine, the effort was to be engaging. And awesome. I think what I saw was that, Across financial services, generally speaking, the marketing was really dry and mm. unattractive and unengaging. Yeah. And, like, the websites were just very boring oh, and yeah. very, like, do you know what I mean? Like, they just hadn't been updated into, like, 2018. And it 20, was just... No, <laughs> 2011, uh, you should say. Yeah, and it, it was kind of like, well, you know, it, even if you kind of, like, go and look at, say, like, the Vanguard website, mm. it's like, no wonder, like, most people don't. Yeah. kind of voluntarily go to the Vanguard. Do you know yeah, what I mean? So definitely. even companies that are doing remarkably well haven't really invested in the user experience mm. and engaging kind of like a younger younger demographic. And so that effort was more how do we kind of market the way that, you know, millennials might expect of their ordinary B2C companies to be marketing to them. Not so much um, the female angle, but probably more the younger angle of getting people just interested and not feeling like there's that intimidation barrier. So this is this is sort of how it's evolved now. But what what was like how did it the first genesis. kick off? Yeah, yeah, tell us about the genesis of <laughs> So, I think there are two stories. Um the first was some years ago I used to work at the Cancer Council in their pro bono 
department. They have like a legal and financial services pro bono yep. department. I probably, probably answered an email from you or something because I did that for yeah. a little bit. I've yeah. had a couple of financial advisors that say, hey, we used to like, you know, anyway. Um, so I used to work from them as one of their like, as, as you uh, like the liaison yeah. Of, yeah well as in like in their call center so like you know just yep. taking the calls and working with the people as like uh, the front person so we would be the people who would actually take the calls and talk to the people and then we'd fill out the form and send it your way yeah um, so, so you'd like assess the need yeah, yeah. and yeah. so we would take them through like that means test and everything and I must have been like got like 20 or something so I was pretty young and pretty like naive about the world and um, pretty I guess optimistic about the world and then, you know, I'd I'd have, like, so many calls from people who were, like, in their 40s, in their 50s, telling me, like, I thought I had my shit together. Am I allowed to swear on this thing? Yeah, yeah, go for <laughs> it. Drop the bombs. Um, I thought I had it together. And then, like, I've been hit with cancer. My husband's been hit with cancer. And suddenly, like, you know, financially, it's just, like, everything's falling apart. And how did we get here? Because I thought I'd done everything right. Whoa. And as a 20-year-old, that's really hard to hear because you kind of assume that by the time I'm 40, I'm going to have my shit together, yeah. right? And then you're hearing all these people saying, I thought I was doing the right things, but now I'm, like, it's falling apart. Like, you know, I can't work because I'm the carer. Husband's got cancer. We've got three kids. We've got a mortgage. And we've got this debt. And it was really obvious to me, like, I have a bit of a background in, like, finance and economics. So, like... I understand the jargon probably better than the average Australian. And even at that stage, it was very obvious to me that most of the people that I was taking calls from didn't have a basic grasp of their finances. You know, like, so we would go through the means test and be like, do you have insurance in your super fund? And they were like, I don't know, you know, Mm. or, you know, what are your assets? It's like, well, I have a car. And so like that basic level of understanding of what constitutes wealth and how to manage your basic wealth and finances just wasn't there. Mm. Um, So that really stayed with me. And then I went off, had a career, management consulting, all of that good stuff after I graduated. Um, And then the second kind of, I think, the closer one that really tipped over the edge was a more personal interaction. Um, I actually wanted to change my super fund. And I was, like, just asking my friends, like, oh, what, like, super fund are you with? Like, you know, why did you choose them? They actually couldn't answer the first question, let alone the second one. Like, they were just like, what super, what super fund am I with? Like, do you know what I mean? And yep. I think that was, you know, like when I was 20, it was like, okay, well, this is a specific segment of the demographic. But now it was like my friend circle and it's like, wow, this got really personal real yeah, quick. You know, it's like yeah. I know these people and I know how they've grown up and I know the education they've had. It It's not. At all. How does this gap like, how, emerge? Why, yeah, yeah, it was just like, this is unacceptable. Like, how do you get to being a doctor on a six-figure salary yeah. and not having any understanding of your money? And then I think it started to just kind of, like, snowball from there. I was like, okay, like, how is this even a thing in society that, you know, money that's something that's so basic that we use for, like, literally every day of our lives till the day we die and we receive zero education on it. And we spend a good deal of our lives chasing after it, whether you want to openly acknowledge that or not, right? Like, we all are impacted by money, and yet, like, most of us just have no clue. Yeah. And so I think that really hit home, and then I kind of started to research. I was like, okay, if my if my friends and I wanted to, like, get our finances sorted, surely there's a solution here, um, what would the solution be? And the main solution was financial advice. Holla. And... The reality is that it was quite expensive. Yeah, right? yeah, it is, yeah. And so when I started to, like, realise that actually 80% of Australians don't ever seek financial advice, um, and a large part of that is because a lot of them can't afford financial advice, it, it was kind of like saying the only way to get healthy is signing up with a really expensive personal trainer. Like, if we didn't have gyms, if we didn't have group fitness classes, if we didn't have alternatives, right, right, it would just be insane, right? Like you either sign up for like five hundred dollars an hour personal trainer, or you just stay obese. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like there needs to be a middle market product mm. that can kind of take you some part of the way for those who can't afford like personal coaching. So that was pretty much it. That is it. <laughs> first of all, first of all, that was so brilliantly articulated. Yeah. I think um, it's something that I've thought about a lot, hmm. and the concept of yeah, a financial planner in a lot of ways is your uh, is your is your 
is your personal trainer. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I guess in a lot of ways, a financial planner tries to automate a lot of it so that, you know, it's almost you're paying a financial planner and then they're doing the lifting for you. Um, so that That's that analogy. Yeah, a bit like a lot of people wish when they go to their personal trainer. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they could actually lift yeah. these weights for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Financial planners can. Yes. <laughs> yes, strangely enough. Yeah, better than personal trainers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Correct, correct. Hence the price. <laughs> um, but but you are, you, what, a, what a great, great, great analogy that the only, if you're obese, your choice is $500 an hour personal trainer or nothing because there's mm. no group classes. And, I mean, I can sit here and I can give you all the, the excuses for why financial planners haven't based around the compliance issues. And then, uh, I mean, I, I guess that's almost, um, oh, it's almost shrouded in a little bit of disingenuousness as well because there's been a, you know, why do it when I make so much money doing it this way? Right? Yeah, and look, Clayton, I don't, th- I don't think that the price of financial advice needs to come down. Mm. Right. So I'm not saying that it's a bad thing that it's super expensive. Yeah. It's just a recognition that a middle market product needs to exist. There are like there are, there are valid reasons as to why financial advice needs to be expensive. If you look at the cost of operating a practice, it's like I've got a background in law. I I know how like law firms like they're expensive. Yeah. There is a, it's expensive to run practices, right? Yeah. I don't know the full costs of, you know, financial planning, but like looking it's at... It's a lot. Yeah, like licenses <laughs> themselves, like, do you know what yeah. I mean? And like the liability and everything. Like, it makes sense, right? Yeah. And so, and I've talked to many financial advisors who say, I got into this because I wanted to help people. But then if you looked at the practicality, once I got into the industry, the only way for me to make a living was to make sure that I was charging a certain rate, yeah. which therefore meant that I was servicing high net worth individuals. Yeah, correct. Right? So like it's... It's not a bad thing. Like you need you need different products for different markets, right? Yeah. So like once you get to a certain income level, you do want to outsource it. You don't want to have to deal with like you don't want to. You just kind of want it done for you, yeah, right? Get but, it done. Yeah, get it done. Totally. But yeah. so I'm not at all crapping on the price of financial advice, but it's more of a recognition that okay, that other eighty well, percent. What's just what's available for yeah, them? Yeah, like what's mm. available on the market. You know, there mm. needs to be an alternative. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think the the industry has been trying to solve for a long time is 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 attracting that eighty percent. And if we look at it, it's actually even worse than that. It's eighty eighty four percent. I think it's Oof. only sixteen percent of the people who get advice. And um and and so how to attract this eighty eighty four percent of people? A lot of it does come down to affordability. Mm. And then we but we've all just sat there and gone, no, oh, well. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, the, uh, I understand that that 84% is out there, but, you know. And so uh, I, it, the first time I saw you, I think it was... Um, when was that? I was trying to James. Remember. It was James from YOLO. Mm. I remember I remember seeing him on social media at one yeah. of your you, but sessions. You, what was our first... So you, you, the TV were reporting on what you were doing and yeah. then James was on there. Yeah. And, That's right. Uh, and, it was and televised. Then, yes, and we were like, "Oh wow, James, what are you doing on TV?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and he said, "Oh no, no, it's not me. It's Paridi." And I said, oh, I have, I have to find out what's going on. So, and, right. and that's how we met. And then you were working at Stone Chalk. Oh, that's or right. Or are yeah, working yeah. at Stone and Chalk yeah. for a couple of days a week. And uh, and I was working there. And uh, I, you were like, yeah, I'm at 11 York Street, <laughs> oh, that's level right. four. This. And I'm like, whoa. Are we on the same floor? Uh, I'm, I'm on level <laughs> five. So I'll just walk down. <laughs> we were trying to like sync up a meet up. And then we realized yeah. we're actually in the same building. Yeah. <laughs> Makes it easy, never, doesn't it? We never like running. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the the other part, the first part of your story around um, that journey that you went on with the mm. the cancer council, that um, like I don't know, if, did you ever get into it? All no, of? no, I tried to. Yeah, um, it was tried it was to get into the pro bonus stuff. Maybe pretty was a like bit difficult. sort of filtered. Were you filtering yeah, advisors out, out as well? This, this Clayton guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Don't let him in. <laughs> but I, I did a few of them, and there's there's guys out there that like do multiple a year yeah. and like really help a lot of people. But I yeah. found it so frustrating because you're there helping. You you don't you can't affect the outcome. The outcome's already defined. Yeah. So you're there trying to just help as much as you can with a situation. Yeah, it's really damage control, and it's really sad. It's mm-hmm. and you, but but like what you realize, I'm there going, shit. Like, 
how do you prevent this? That's yeah. sort of where, and and yeah, you can only do so much. A lot of the people advisors work with, um, they're on track to to not be like that because mm. of that. Um, so that's happening. But like, there's the a lot of the people that are dealing you're dealing with through the pro bono program were never ever going to get financial advice. And that's the point. Like, there's a huge and like I think you know you alluded to this as well. The whole affordability issue is that there is a certain percentage of the market that is never going to sign up for financial advice. It's just not it's just not a sensible option for them. Yeah, totally. You know? But that doesn't mean that they should be, like, f- in financial distress. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, it doesn't mean that they should just... And the other option is that you self-educate, yes. right? And that means that, like, you're trying to read, like, the Barefoot Investor and yes. Money Smart and, like, yes. Google. And, yes. and that's, you know, if I, put, if I just rewind a little bit, when I was, like, looking at the profile of my friends... These are people who hadn't done a single economics or finance class in their life. They'd gotten to 25. They'd done great professions. And not a single class on even, like, what's the definition of inflation? Well, right? it's, it's even – but even people that work in finance. Like, yeah. this is Clay's experience as well. Yeah. Like, he, he used to work with quite a few people that were in finance. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't define whether you know. So it's, it's actually like – it's almost like a personality filter. The self-starter, yeah. the guy, that, the person that's going to go out there and read and learn stuff. Totally. And then, yeah, and then maybe do it. But yeah. there's not a lot of yeah. those people. It's but. not just that there's not a lot, but there's a huge um, there's a huge barrier to entry to self-education because for a lot of people who don't know the jargon, and I had multiple people tell me this, is that I tried to start reading a website and then I came across a word I didn't understand. So then I clicked on that word and then I went to another website to read what the definition of that word was. And there were five more words that I didn't... Do you know what? Like, it's, like, it's really rabbit. hard oh. to, like, if you don't understand what, like, how, what tax is, you're not going to understand what a marginal tax rate is. You're mm. not going to understand how tax... Do you know what I mean? Like, it's really, really hard to self-educate if you don't have a baseline level of understanding. Yeah. No, you're right. It's been uh, so long since mm. since I was in that position. But I, I remember I came out of living in a small little town and then I played music and then I read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 21. Ah, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it mm. broke open my mind mm-hmm. like a caramel egg and the ah, gooeyness just fell out everywhere because I, I just realized there was this whole other world I didn't know. It took me a long time to, to skill up. Um, so let's let's actually, so the, the, these are all the reasons why you were considering doing what you're doing now, which is skilled smart. Mm. Um, and and then I think, I think a lot of companies have come out and attempted to do what you, you, you you're doing. Um, but you've, I think you've got a certain ability to get people's attention. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So that, that's obviously like a, a compliment to, to your abilities, but, um, I, it's also, it's, it's, and it's one of those things that you watch and you go, okay, so I can't put my finger on why you're resonating, but mm. I know that you're resonating. So, um, would, do you have a theory on why you're resonating in this space? Um, I think I think it's actually because I'm not coming at it from a finance angle. I'm coming at it from a marketing angle. And I think the challenge that I see a lot of in a lot of professions, and this is not just financial planning, but even say law, right, is that, Lawyers think like lawyers. Financial planners think like financial planners. I'm not a financial planner and I don't think like a financial planner. So when I started this, it wasn't about financial planning. It was about selling education, right? Like how do I make that resonate? And I see this mistake happen a lot in like small business, like people who open their own practices is, you know, you go in to, for example, you want to be like a, a a lawyer, you want to start your own practice, you open your own practice and then you're taking clients and then you realise, oh, man, I've got to market myself. I've got to sell my – like, do you know what I mean? Like that's a whole other part of the – Skill set. Skill set that people don't necessarily anticipate when they start a, a profession-oriented business. Yes. Um, and so I, I probably think that's why, like, I've, I've been able to kind of not get so stuck in the weeds of – trying to, you know, become the best financial planner out there because that's not actually what I'm trying to do, right? And so I've from day one, um, I've been very conscious of 
for example, how am I writing the copy? What are the colors that I'm using? How am I going to, do you know what I mean? Like that was forefront. That was, wow. yeah. That's cool. cool. Yeah. I guess like one of the biggest reasons why people don't break through those barriers. And like you, you were talking about the barriers people get through once they actually break through the initial barrier, which yeah. you're dealing with, with your marketing, mm. which is the scariness of it all. So a lot of people don't even get to asking those questions that you were talking about asking yeah. just before. They don't even get to the terminology bit because they're just there's a, there's a block there of the way they're communicated to totally. in this space. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and it's like, it just perpetuates that. And I think part of the um, challenge and going back to your question and why it's resonating is, you know, what I often see is um, people in the profession forget what it's like to be a beginner and they start to talk to beginners as professionals and that's not how beginners are going to resonate. They get turned off by that. They get very intimidated by that. And so, you know, like, you know, part of, for example, the screening that I do with my instructors is can they talk like a normal person, you know? Can they dress like a normal person? (laughs) Like, do you know what I mean? Like (laughs) as in lose the tie, lose the suit. So, you know, so it's, I think it's challenging when you are like a deep expert in something to go back and rewind and be a beginner and talk like a beginner or talk like a beginner wants to hear. What's amazing, yeah, the the assumed knowledge mentality that people develop as they learn. Mm. Like and it's sort of you you really have to consciously think about your journey and what you've learned along the way to to recall that like, okay, a super contribution is not necessarily a simple thing. Yeah. And my, I see that in my instructors. Like, you know, I've never had an instructor who got it the first time. Like the instructors, I actually have a process now where they have to watch a class and they usually come out of that going, oh, this is really basic, right? And I've, like, I see in most of my instructors' classes, the first few cohorts, and I'll be dialing them back. I'm like, guys, no one in this class knows who Warren Buffett is. Don't use that exact. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, wow. So, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, no one even knows who Warren Buffett is. Yeah, like we're, ta- we're talking about people who yeah, on, on right. the weekends, they don't like they don't read the AFR. Yeah, you know, yeah, they, yeah, they yeah, go to yeah, high yeah. tea or they go yeah. shopping. They yeah. don't Maybe care. use Justin Hems as an example. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a good one. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It's like understanding the mentality of where these people are actually at and meeting them where they are mm. instead of assuming that they know what it's like on a trading floor or they know who Warren Buffett is. Or just or, requiring that jump to yeah, occur sort of thing. yeah. So, so what? Are, how, you, how have you? Because it really does sound like you. You're talking about this marketing, um, I guess, thinking. How have you validated? So, on this journey, how have you validated the resonate, like that you're resonating, and the way you're doing things have been resonating with the classes? That's a really good question. So, I think a lot of it comes down to my initial process. So, when I started out, I actually spent quite a lot of time interviewing both sides of the coin. So I spent a lot of time interviewing people who I thought were my potential customer and then a lot of financial advisors as well. And that gave me a really good understanding of what is the kind of language that both parties are using, what are the kind of problems that most of them are talking about. Um, And, you know, so for example, on the financial advisor side, I had financial advisors tell me that, yeah, sometimes we have to turn away clients because they're not ready for financial advice. And it's just, it's sad because if they were just budgeting or if they were just managing their cash flow, they'd be so, so much further along but we don't have a service that can help them, right? And so I was able to kind of piece together a lot of, you know, what what both sides of the kind of coin were talking about. And I think one thing that people often miss in marketing is language is really important. And the only way you start to understand the language of your customer is by talking to your customer and actually being able to say, okay, what are the really common phrases that my customer uses, right, to actually describe their problem? And that starts to give you a feel for how do they want a solution to appear in terms of, you know, how they're phrasing their problem. So I think is it like almost what's going to be um, like more comfortable for them to hear? So yeah. Like what's well, what's going to be – less pushing? Well, in the sense that you can't offer a a solution if you don't understand how someone is describing their problem, right? Mm. So if, for example, someone was saying, hey, I want to make 20% returns, right? That's a very different problem to, I don't know the first thing about finance, Mm. you know? And so if you don't understand like what language they're using to actually describe their problem, you're going to have a very, like, you're going to be 
creating a solution based on what you think the problem is. So what are these, like, if, so we've got a lot of financial advisors listening. What yeah. are some of the, because what you're doing is super relevant to advisors' communications with their clients. Yeah. So what are some of the techniques? Is there lots of analogies that you guys use or what are, how in do. In marketing? Oh, well, in terms of, like, so your training of the instructors that are yeah. then communicating. What oh, are some of the things okay. that you're getting them to do to bridge that gap? And, yeah. So one is, I think, you know, people relate to human stories. So one of the things I always get my uh, instructors to do is like, actually, you know, try and pre-plan some stories that you think might be relevant, right? If we're talking about insurance, you've probably had clients who had really good or really bad insurance stories that you can actually use to illustrate this example. Or um, So that's one. The other is, I think there is... Um, a massive shift that needs to occur in experts and professionals generally between telling and then having a conversation, right? So I see a lot of instructors that initially, when they get up initially, they just kind of want to preach and they just, they just want to have like a one-way conversation and they just want to present. These are the contribution caps and this yeah. is how much it will cost if you do this. As opposed to saying like, hey guys, what do you think about life insurance? What's your experience been? Like, like pull them in. Yeah. Well, actually have a conversation mm. with them, right? Like it's, it's it's a lot it's it's much harder on the ears if someone's standing up there going, This is why insurance is important mm. versus starting and saying, Well, what do you guys think? And yeah. we always have someone in the class who's like, I think insurance is a load of shit. Right. And then from there you can go, Cool. Well, you don't have to buy it. But today I'm just gonna explain to you what the different types are and you can make a decision at the end, right? But that kind of for that person, you've kind of just taken that objection and said, I've acknowledged that objection and that's totally okay, right? Mm. But if, if you're kind of going in it from a preaching mode or like a, like I, I, I'm the expert, therefore I know, mm. right? It's very, it's it's a lot different on the ears to saying, have a conversation with well, me. Well, leading, yeah. yeah, ask, not tell. So leading with yeah. a question is validating their presence there. Yeah, totally. Like, but you guys, you guys are worth it to be here. Like, tell us, tell us what you yeah. think. We, we value, we value what you think about. Totally. Mm. And I think, I think increasingly, especially with younger generations, they don't want to be told. They want to be a part of the solution that's being designed. I'm them. horrible to be told what yeah. to do. Exactly, <laughs> right? So it's like, you know. I, I can know. relate to it. I'm like, <laughs> don't tell me what to do. Ask me what I think about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Like they want, to, they want to be part of, they want to feel like they're being brought in to co-design that solution about their own money, you know, mm. like so it's. More of a collaborative process, I think, than um, a I'm the expert and I know what's best for you type of thing. That's, I mean, super interesting because that's a good insight into how you're running the the um, the sessions that you're doing. And, and you know, you you your business is financial education, so if you're getting instructors to sort of help lead people along via a community via a conversation way of engagement. Um, what about, like, why is your marketing working well? Because I agree, engagement is hugely important. You need to mm. you need to engage before you can educate. And I also massively agree with the human story piece. I think human stories are, are very, very engaging. Um, but that's not what you're doing when you're marketing. Mm. When you're marketing on a Twitter or LinkedIn, um, you're using a different method because it's you're unable to do that in, you know, 160 characters or whatever mm. it is. So what are you doing in your marketing yeah. that's working well? So I think um, to peel it back, I actually spent about six months upskilling in digital marketing about two years ago. So when I first knew that, like, I want to kind of start some kind of business, I was like, hey, this is a pretty important topic <laughs> to understand, right? Yeah. So. I invested pretty heavily in understanding that space. And I think that is really, really key. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, because it then you kind of – and I'm still learning. I'm, like, by no means an expert, yeah. But I think um, that allowed me to come at it understanding what are the various channels available to me and how to go about testing each of those and what might be beneficial at various stages. Like, for example, like I knew that AdWords probably wasn't going to be right for the earlier stages of the business. I kind of I, I kind of had a sense of like, you know, what um, 
what are the various channels and how they work. Because I'd seen it. Like, I did some freelance digital marketing for about a year. I'd, you know, I'd kind of spent some time in the digital marketing space. Mm. Interesting. So, so what are the hottest tips for advisors? Well, out wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Before, <laughs> before we, we don't need to yeah. dive, dive into it to that extent. But yeah. um, I'm definitely interested to, to know let's say I wanted to upskill my yeah. digital marketing. Yeah. What What are some of the things that you did or where should I yeah. push me in the right direction? So I did the short course with General Assembly. That right. is a bit of a investment. Yep. Um, but I did that because I'd spent some time self-educating and interestingly it was a similar level of overwhelm with digital marketing when I was starting out as it might be with finance for a beginner um, in the sense that it was kind of like, oh, there's SEO, oh, there's, what, like, you know, where do I, what do I do, right? And I didn't really know how do you look at the bigger picture, right? And so by doing the course, it was good because you kind of saw the bigger picture view and then you're kind of able to understand how it all fits together, like from a strategic perspective. And then that allows you to kind of be like, okay, I, I understand where content marketing sits as opposed to AdWords, right? So for example, content marketing, it's a long-term play. It's not a short, you're not going to put out a blog post and get three customers, right? Aww. It's just not going to happen. Um, whereas <laughs> like AdWords is great for like short-term testing and right. things like that. Yeah. So like, you, you kind of start to learn from a strategic perspective how does digital marketing play out and mm. what do you need to invest in to get different results at different points of your business. Mm. So that was a really useful um, starting point for me. So did you come out of that with like a clear trajectory going, at this point in the business, I will then start doing this? No, it, no, okay. no, no, oh, no. It's like, it's the answer like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it gives you like a really good foundation, mm. yeah, um, and then you're able to start piecing it together and tr- like testing and learning and all of that. So well, I suppose because a lot of people sort of hear about marketing and they hear the concepts, and but they're just looking at them. They're yeah. not. They're not coming up above all the different concepts of marketing channels that you can use and going, okay, what's the rationale? Like you're saying yeah. in terms of what's the rationale. Unless you're Clayton. Um, I've I've seen uh, Adrian Patty do some hilarious attempts at marketing. I remember when uh, you started your company. This is about pretty. And and, <laughs> and, and, and got wildly off track here. And and, and 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 Adrian thought it was a good idea that everyone and their dog would want a little booklet. On, on on his business and oh, just have pictures that was a pictures of Sydney. Brochure. It's just it pictures was. of the Harbour Bridge and and things like super. You need to look at your super account. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Uh, it was and, such a nice and I brochure. remember looking at it just going, <laughs> who 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 do you give this to? Do you give this to someone who wants a financial planner or do you give this to an existing client and how do you give it to them? Are you going to stand it on the street or is it just meant for them in the in your waiting <laughs> office? Like it was so hilarious. But you I, I say the same thing about his book. Touche, good sir, touche. Digital marketing is so important that uh, I, I know a financial planner who was living in England and he his job was to he would receive leads from from a from a big institution, and then he would take those leads and give them a call, and then it was his job to turn them into clients. And uh, it, it you know a, a, as Glenn Gary Glenn Ross would say, the leads are weak, right? So so the the he's he, it wasn't leading to a lot of business. So he learned how to do digital marketing, and he ended up being the most successful uh, financial planner in in his office simply because he wasn't using the leads that he was getting. He was developing his own leads via digital marketing. He ended up getting so good at it that he built a digital marketing agency and just recently sold it for like multiple millions of dollars. He started out as a financial planner. Um, What's interesting about that story and what you're talking about now is if you nail the digital marketing space, if you are engaging with that 180 characters or on that LinkedIn post and with your colors and and everything that you're talking about, it's amazing what can be achieved. And I think traditionally in financial advice, we haven't really tried to do too much there. A, there was always the the problem, the issue that maybe you say something wrong, Um, but it was really more why bother when you know, a uh, uh, friend. The simpler. Yeah, simpler ways of get it that are more immediate. Hey, do you mm. know anyone that needs Instant advice? Instant client gratification yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, correct. And there was never need to build too much of a pipeline because, you know, you don't need. Well, it's an investment. 
Like you had to, it is an you investment. had to put effort into it. Yeah, correct. And so now that, you know, you've spent a bit of time, you've got that skill up your sleeve, you're now achieving traction, um, you're drawing the attention of uh, not only financial planners, but also, uh, you know, clients who are learning in your company. Um, where are you headed? What's That's the next question. step? Yeah. Bigger and better. Are you, are you yeah. going for? Le- are you going for learn? Are you going for learn best? <laughs> is, is are you oh, going? So for, have you seen what's happened to learn best uh, since it's been purchased? Yeah, it's pretty much been it's gutted. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so they just stripped out the tech. They just stripped out everything. They just put it's product just a, in there. It's uh, just a, it's devastating. Well, no, like well, it's got it's got logos, branding, and everything on the. Isn't it just like a content platform now? I don't know. I haven't, uh, I haven't is seen. it? I don't know. Last time I looked at it, I was I was. Just disappointed. Well, just for the just for the listeners, because LearnVest, I know it's like one of the more sort of robust, so to speak, um, advice platforms in the US. But do they have a specific? Like, well, when did you last look at it? Years ago. Oh no! So like in the last year, oh. they scrapped their whole model, and now they're just a digital publishing. Oh. So yeah, just so Northwestern that bought them. I think it was Northwestern for three hundred something Whatever. million dollars. They yeah. scrapped it. They just said like they tried it for a few years, got rid of the whole thing. And now Whoa. they are just a content publishing, yeah, right. kind of like the balance, if you guys have. Okay. No. Yeah. No. That's like a, yeah. It, it, but, but going back to its, its original purpose, which was financial education mixed in with helping people develop their own plans and yeah. things like that, um, is that where you're headed? Um, I just want to know because when do question. I invest if you're going to yeah. be worth three hundred million dollars? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, any day is fine. <laughs> the earlier the better, Clay. You know, you always get a better deal. You never know when I'm going to become a unicorn. Um, no, so, um, the short answer is, I think tech is important. Sure, but I don't think it's important in the immediate to short term. Cool. So you just, just stick with the with the format you've got going at the moment, which is workshops. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, I think it's going to be an education play for at least the next 12 to 24 months. Are you going to turn into a registered training organization? No, because RTOs are more for vocational. From yeah. What I understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and this was never intended to be vocational. Well, so it's and all... then it starts to get dictated by other yeah. parties in terms yeah. of what you do. Yeah. Like it's like you got to match to like a syllabus that's already been predefined. Yeah. yeah, and I think like part of our, like the way that we sell it is inherently not. Like you structured. Know, well, it is structured, Overly, sorry, okay, but yep. it's not like you're going to a community college to learn a certain skill, which then you can kind of upskill your vocation. Like it's meant to be p- for personal use, and I think there's um, there's a certain like look and feel that like University of Sydney type marketing might have mm. compared to just like you know the kind of marketing that we do. So um, yeah, it was never intended to be like something that you can put on your LinkedIn profile type of thing. So I there's a I, I sort of got I was um on the FPA chapter and we started looking at um like and a lot of advisors in the group have looked at school education around financial literacy. Mm. And there's a lot of awesome advisors that are out there that are um spending time in schools. Um there's a couple of good programs that have come through. Um mm. what's what's the one? Um Spriggy? Oh yeah, Spriggy. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, so there's a few things that really get into school and starting to um, teach concepts. Mm. But we came across, we actually went down to talk to the education, uh, yeah, the education department mm. um, down at Oxford Street or whatever. And it was just really interesting that it wasn't making its way into the core curriculum. Yeah. It was still an option that the principal would be able to make a call on. Mm. So you've got, they've got this huge overflowing curriculum and syllabus that the teachers have to deal with. And it was up to the principal on what was allowed in still there. So it wasn't, it hadn't made it into the core sufficiently. And and you look at what Money Smart's got. There's some amazing stuff on there. Yeah, like totally. what they've put together. Yeah. Um, but it's just like, obviously, there would have to be a lot of work before there would be nothing for you to do. And yeah. there's always going to be well, people that don't listen to at school. But what could they do? What what would you see as sort of helping the problem at a broader scale? Like, because you, mm. can, you can do your part. And, yeah. I have a bit of a controversial view about <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Tell me. about education, financial education. In education schools. in general. Yeah. Scrap the schooling system. Yeah. It's going nowhere. <laughs> Anarchy. Well, that, but, you know, um, like, okay, so a, a lot of people talk to me about financial education in schools and why I'm not doing it in schools. And I think, so initially when, we, when I started out, um, I knew there was a need for financial education. 
in general. And so I tested various markets, right? So I went and talked to people at uni. I went and talked to, like, like high school leavers, that kind of thing. And there are a couple of things that I think are really important to remember. And I think the first is that kids don't have money. And it's really hard <laughs> yeah, to care about, care about something you don't have. <laughs> you yeah. don't have money. You become really, you really care about money when you have it and it's, you know, bleeding out of your bank and you're like, shit, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you understand? Like, well, actually, well, you should, but a lot of people but, still don't care but that's about that's the money. point at which, that's the point at which people start There is to something care. to care about. There is, there needs to be mm. something to care about. And kids are just too removed from. You can sell them greed. Like, so can't really. Because accumulation of money. That just becomes like, you know, they get everything. It's just they get everything from the parents. So they just become greedy yeah, kids. Yeah, no, you put forward a very good point. Do you understand? And so, like, it's very hard to, like, I don't remember a lot of the things that I learned at school because I just didn't care about geography, mm. you know, like. Oh, the whole I don't give a shit about stuff factor. Yeah. That teenagers have. Like, so it's yeah. very hard to, like. We find that the most, the people who make the most progress are the people who care. And the people who care are the people who have a motivation to care. You, you know, we've, for example, we just had a student who was like in her late 50s. She can see retirement around the corner. She cannot see her capacity to actually afford retirement. She's very, very motivated, mm. right? We have people who are just about to have a kid, mm. right? They're very, very motivated. There's very similar triggers to when people engage with financial advisors. Yeah, it is. But it just actually they're able to do something with you as opposed to being scared off by the fees or... Yeah. And mm. so the idea of education in schools, it's a noble one, but I don't know if it's the most effective one, right? The second challenge that you have is that most high school teachers or school teachers themselves aren't really great with money. Like, you know, they're not necessarily trained to be talking about asset allocation. Like, And that's why one of my pet peeves is that for some reason, the one thing, the one word that most people associate with money, guess what it is? Um, Debt. Budgeting. Oh, okay. Damn it. Yeah. Like if you talk to people, right, it's like, what do you want to learn about money? Oh, budgeting. It's like they say that by default because they think that is, the so road be. to good money management. They don't know anything else. Yeah. And I believe that's partly because you've got untrained teachers in school who are doing life skills classes and talking about budgeting. Mm. And it's like, well, actually, that's not the most important thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's What is not... the most important thing for you? Oh, that's a tough, <sighs> that's question, a tough question, Adrian. Jesus. I was just curious. Yeah. I think it's, for me personally, I think the most important thing is understanding the difference between money and wealth. Right. So what I see in students mm. is, and what I see in the mass population, is that most people think having an income and having a bigger and bigger and bigger income is the most important thing. More is better. Yeah, and they don't actually understand the process of how that gets converted into wealth and yeah, assets. Yeah, yeah. So, so they mm. inc- income versus assets. Mm. Yeah, actually, so I'm earning more, but I'm spending more, but I, I'm, I've got money. But I'm, I'm rich because yeah. I'm earning like 300000 Yeah, I, Well, you I, had a few clients like I, that. Very similar... Uh, idea that yeah the difference between an expense and a liability mm. and you're saying the difference between income and asset yeah. yeah it's very true i think those two things hugely important yeah hugely. especially because the reality is that most of us or like the, the most of the population has this illusion that if i had more money if i had a high, bigger income mm. everything would be fine right and they look at people on high incomes as though that's aspirational, yeah. right? And they don't realize that actually a lot of people on those incomes are also broke. They're still mm. paycheck to paycheck mm-hmm. because they're not, they're not saving. They're not, 100%. do you know what I mean? Like they've just got that lifestyle. They don't understand that. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. Good answer. Nice. Yeah. Good answer. What do you think, Clay? <laughs> well, I've already answered. Yeah, difference between a liability and expense. Uh, and I remember the moment that dawned on me. I was sitting uh, in in my accounting class, and uh, and we're going through expense and liability. And it, and it like like it's, uh, I was sitting there, and uh, the finger of God come down and just bounced off my forehead, and I <laughs> I understood the difference between expense and liability. And I realized in that exact moment how important. That is one is uh, a one-off, and the other is constantly eating your money behind your back without you even thinking about it. And right then and there, uh, that was probably the biggest epiphany I've had with money. But to your point, 
people who who have money that's dripping in on a regular basis see that as the be all and end all, whereas it's actually the bits that aren't growing any further through more contributions is actually the most important part because that will end up becoming the new drip feed when you no longer can add to that. So, yeah. Yeah. Nice, guys. I, 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 I think we'll just sit with those great two great answers there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about what the journey looks like when someone first engages with you going through the program. What are some of the, like, how are those next steps sort of playing? Uh, like, yeah, that's a are... good question. What's the journey like from the time that someone drops into your market, digital marketing campaign? Mm. Do you know this sort oh, of detail? Oh, it's not that. It's not that automated yet. Um, <laughs> right. I'd love to get to that point. <laughs> but do you <laughs> have some idea of how long it takes for someone to warm up to you before they attend a workshop? Um, it's no, kind of actually. hard data to well, get. I was I was actually more alluding to their journey, and that, and that was part class. of the journey. But yeah, like, what's their learning journey, and what are the? Do you have tiered oh. steps in it? Do you have a or, framework, or is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So it's all very structured, and right. it's been structured around the like the core elements of what a financial advisor would go through. Oh, so, wow, cool. Um, okay. It's like, you know, you kind of go through the basics of like, you know, um, your saving and budgeting, then your insurance, and then your investing, and then your tax and super. And so, wow. yeah, like every week they have like a new topic and they kind of sequentially understand things in, in a way that's designed. Is there gamification? Of, no, no, not really. No. I don't know, I'm just, yeah. just asking. I might get there one day. But Do they get badges for anything? Okay, something you need to know about Adrian. They get to save a ton of money, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so how, yeah. So, is the, are you measuring what they have when they – how they start with um, you and then – So we do do like follow-up calls. Like okay. I'll, I'll pretty much um, do a follow-up call like after about a month and then depending on how I kind of feel about where they're at, maybe every three months. Um, okay. so, so is there yeah. is there follow-up – so they do – Is it a, so it's a one-off program – and then is there anything that they would then revisit with you? Um, so we're having a couple of people come back to do it a second time, okay. of course. Um, so I think we're old enough now. We've just hit about over a year. Um, awesome. But there isn't a second product for them to fall into at the moment. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, I think the thing is that a lot of them, like, it's a lot It's a lot of content in the first course. And the reality is that um, a lot of them aren't able to action everything in that course period of time. And so it takes them a while, even after the course, to kind of go through. And Because, you know, like, it's we're like, for example, like, for the superannuation bit, like, you know, we're like, hey, hop on the phone with your superannuation fund and here are, like, all the 50 questions that you should ask them. Oh, right. that's really cool. So, yeah, it's it takes them a while to get through all of those activities. And yeah. so it's not something that they need to immediately be, like, funneled into, like, a high-level product because it's going to take them a while to even get through you know, mm. what they – like, what, it's a pretty comprehensive program and if you actually do all the activities, like, you will get 70% of the way there. And what is the cost? The cost? Yeah. Yeah, so it's about $99 a week at the moment with, okay. like, it, it will probably go from, like, between $99 a week to $150 a week. To – for how long? For six weeks. Six weeks. Wow. Okay. And and you're running these uh, every six weeks? So you, you start um, one? Currently got three courses running concurrently. So we Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. Yeah. All just in Sydney at the moment? Well, it's a virtu- we've got a virtual offering. Mm, so we've got... It. Um, yeah. We've Could got- advisors make use of this to support... Because a lot, of, I guess, like you've invested a lot to develop this framework, and mm. like, and you, we talk about the cost of advice, and the reason why a lot of advisors can't spend this time is because it's expensive to spend all this time and and develop all this, um, I guess, curriculum. Yeah, the content. curriculum. And yeah. So is is there is that something that advisors could could work with? As in, should they be doing it themselves? No, no. I'm saying we, I'm As I'm coming from the assumption that well, advisors can't. Like a lot of the time, put this together. They don't. Yeah. They, it doesn't. The financials don't stack up. They've got clients to see. They're doing stuff. Yeah, as in white label it. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, so it's something that I've uh, considered. It's probably not going to be on offer anytime soon. Um, and yeah, I think I think um, I think one of the reasons is that when I looked at whether there was room for this. 
what I found is that there are financial advisors who are doing education programs, right? Mm. But there is an appetite in the market for having something that's independent, that isn't a sales funnel into someone's yeah, financial services. good point. Do you know what I mean? Like as in the idea that you can go so to this place, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can learn, yeah. and you can feel very safe in the knowledge that, that no one is trying to sell you that you're some not going to sign up to something at the end service right at the end. Right. right. Fair enough. And it's like, look, I, I totally respect where you're coming from, Adrian. And well, I think, I'm thinking actually they've already, they already want to work with the advisor, but the advisor's going, this person needs some upskilling. So they've identified a need and they're like, well, I can't spend this much time. I've got to charge them way yeah. too much to deal with this. Yeah. This would be really beneficial for this person to go through. Yeah. That's an interesting concept. That's more the concept because it's not a funnel into the advisor. It's like... It's, oh, it's for hard like for an advisor clients. to, if the advisor is the only person that can have these conversations in their business mm. and they've got a lot of competing um, clients to deal with and that, with their time and strategies yeah. to do. We have had um, financial planning um, like practice as a protest for white labeling. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be a different product because the product that we've designed is designed to be delivered by an instructor. Even the online? Yeah, it's delivered live by an instructor. Ah, it's not so it's like a live material. webinar each. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And so it's specifically designed to be delivered by an instructor, right? Okay. And so there is definitely room for like a white labeling, uh, different products mm. that we might put out. Um, but the one that we've currently got is designed to be like presented live. Did so, they? Did they not like the idea of someone else presenting? Oh, they were looking for something that was like no presentation required. You can just plug Content. and play, get their clients to do the. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. self service sort of thing. Yeah, is that is that what you were alluding to? I, I was alluding because I thought that would was what the online yeah, would right. be. Yeah, but yeah. But the instructing yeah, no. can still work. It's like it's yeah. just about economies of scale. You got a smaller business that like to invest and develop something that's good. Mm. It takes takes time and effort. So it's a bit of time effort. pull in resources. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. Yeah, there's definitely scope for it. Mm. So That's if anyone's right. interested, just yeah. reach out to Fruity. Totally, can make it work. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for coming on. If, if advisors or anyone wants to reach out and learn more, yes. how would they do that? Um, Paridi at skilledsmart.com.au. My first name. Well, are you going to put it in the show notes? Or like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Only because people know who you are. They'll be able to click. They're going to be able to click a. Button. They won't even have to try and spell your name or anything. Yeah, I was just like, do I spell out my name <laughs> on the podcast or do I do that? Well, <laughs> um, yeah, so pretty at skilledsmart.com.au. Awesome. You can flick me an email and we'd love to catch up. I'm always looking for like um, like professionals who want to speak as well. We yeah, run like events yeah, and workshops. Yeah. Clayton was at one of our panels. Yes. So, yeah, always good to connect. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing your, your insights. I think you've come at it from a really cool, unique angle. And, mm. uh, yeah, hopefully advisors can uh, take something from that. Thanks so much, Clayton and Adrian. Yeah, cheers, awesome. Cheers. Good to be here.